Okay, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Mamone, who's the Associate Vice President for Innovation and also the Interim Executive Director of the Office of Technology Commercialization. Uh, thank you, Lori, uh, especially for taking care of the, the meanness uh, factor, the cell phone. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone on behalf of Rutgers University and UMDMJ uh, to this event, which is uh, really dedicated to, to the support of the medical device industry uh, within New Jersey. I think it was uh, Michael Porter, the uh, Harvard professor of business, who first coined the word uh, business cluster. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the Harvard uh, business cluster map, uh, New Jersey is not only a, a cluster for uh, biopharma, which we all you know, would understand, but also for medical devices. So it's really our intention today to bring together all the different uh, constituent parts of the medical device industry and try to energize that cluster and that uh, ecosystem. The, um, the innovation uh, ecosystem basically combines talent, capital, and knowledge to create new products. So sometimes uh, it's called a cluster or an uh, ecosystem. The idea is to create more economic impact, so increasing jobs, increasing profits, uh, increasing the quality of jobs, and that, that's our, our goal here. Uh, the ecosystem uh, has many component parts. Some are the pu uh, public sector, such as uh, education, regulatory bodies, uh, and tax incentives and things like that, which we have uh, representatives here today to discuss, and also the private sector, which have things like um, you know, uh, contract research organizations, contract research manufacturers, uh, distributors, suppliers, and the like. So we're fortunate uh, today to have representatives from all these different uh, aspects here who are going to present uh, their views on these different issues. Uh, first uh, up on, on the list is our keynote speaker, Harlan uh, uh, Weissman, uh, Dr. Harlan uh, Weissman. Uh, Holland uh, is a unique uh, speaker on this issue because he cuts across, he started in academia, <clears throat> went to industry, and now he's in government. So he cuts across all the three major sectors. Uh, Holland was um, a professor in John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Initially, then at uh, J&J, he was the chief science <clears throat> and technology officer of the medical devices and diagnostics. He was also the uh, president of J&J Pharmaceutical R&D and uh, Transform uh, Pharmaceuticals. He's the president of uh, CentiCorps, and currently <coughs> he's uh, on the board of uh, governors of the uh, Congressional uh, Patent Protection, uh, Patient Protection and Affordability Care Act of 2010. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Holland to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Ramon, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I don't know how to work this. Favors me. In case you didn't recognize me up here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the golden age of innovation, and whether it's behind us or it's still ahead of us. Um, today, when we look at what's going on in healthcare in the United States, but really throughout the globe. There's really two big opposing trends, and I'll explain why I say they're opposing. The first is um, that there is increasing demand uh, for patient-centered, value-driven um, health care. Now, what does that mean? Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about it. What it often gets translated to, uh, at least how it's interpreted on the um, um, industry side of things, is it's a way of controlling costs. It's about cost containment and therefore anti-innovation because innovation is often looked at as a new cost driver. Um, but that isn't what it's intended to mean. And I think um, if uh, we can move things along in uh, what's being called um, the innovation ecosystem in the United States, we can find that we really can get to a patient-centered value-driven um, and science-driven um, 
healthcare system which provides value for all the stakeholders. And I'll talk about that um, as part of my talk. The other thing that's happening, and on the very exciting side of things, um, is that there's really been explosive growth um, in what we know um, in science, in, in biomedicine, in biology, um, in molecular biology, um, engineering, and um, that these advances are uh, bringing forward many new exciting technologies on the pharmaceutical side, on the device side, and the diagnostic side. So on the one hand, we have all these things that we can harness to bring to healthcare, to improve the lives of people who are suffering from disease or people who are at risk of developing disease. Yet today, they're, these things are viewed as new and expensive, and in fact, they are expensive because they're very costly to develop, and increasingly, um, the, the risk of developing them is becoming um, so high that in some fields, um, such as regenerative medicine, people are, are actually backing away from it. But again, I don't want to be pessimistic, it is this balance, and I'm very optimistic, in fact, that, that over time, by bringing stakeholders together, we can actually make this ecosystem work again. So I've pretty much drawn this map, this map of uh, where we are today in the innovation ecosystem, borrowing from Charles Dickens. Um, it is the best of times. There's a lot of things to look forward to in terms of what we can do in innovation in healthcare and in healthcare products and in healthcare services. But I've already touched on the fact that it's also the worst of times. We're seeing a lot of things drying up in this country. It's the age of wisdom, but it's the age of foolishness. It's the epic of belief. It's the epic of incredulity. It's the season of light. It's the season of darkness. It's the spring of hope. It's the winter of despair. And you know, through this talk and maybe through our panel discussion, we can discuss how we can move everything over to the left side of these bullets. Um, this is just a picture of um, the medical device industry today and the pie diagram, if you can see it, um, it's pretty bright up there. I don't know if there's a way of just dimming right where the slides are. Um, there, you know, I looked at lots and lots of surveys and other things going on, but they're pretty consistent with the idea that today in the United States, the medical device market is over $100 billion. So it's a, you know, this is a healthy market. Um, in the United States, um, on a per capita basis, um, we're number three in the term of the use of uh, medical devices. Two countries, smaller European countries, but in fact, economically, um, perhaps more vibrant economies um, are ahead of us, Denmark and Switzerland. And the largest medical device companies are really centered in the US. And about um, the majority of products in medical devices are in the US are from US companies. And a lot of the US companies, even the large players, their, their products are coming from uh, people like all of you. They're coming from entrepreneurs. They're coming from university laboratories. Um, the question is, how can we facilitate that flow um, to keep it going? Um, the medical device industry um, is not trivial in the sense of the economy because you know, we've been in a, a um, difficult economic times. That's part of what has um, pushed down and suppressed our markets. Um, but innovation helps drive the economy. It helps drive jobs. And you can see, um, and these numbers are a little old. They're uh, from, I think, 2007, 2008. 350,000 employees in the medical device industry, um, accounting for about $20 billion in salaries. So if you, you know, that's a, a significant chunk of money to um, help drive the economy. And I already mentioned that the market size is over $100 billion. Um, each medical technology job is estimated to generate 4.5 additional jobs. And they're high paying jobs when they exist. Um, this is just a snapshot of, of, and it's pretty complicated, and I, I don't want you to look at the details, but it's the idea that there are different pathways. And, and uh, one of our panelists from the FDA uh, may speak about changes in these pathways to bringing um, devices and diagnostics forward from the idea to um, 
the invention stage, the early concept stage, where we're trying to prove proof of concept, through development, <clears throat> to the extent development is necessary, all the way to commercialization and life cycle management of products once they're in the market. Um, depending on the device or diagnostic, um, and depending on its regulatory pathway, <clears throat> it can be anywhere from around three months to many years. And, you know, I've illustrated up there the 510K pathway, which are for um, products that are viewed as, um, from a safety standpoint, as less, uh, less risky in terms of uh, safety issues and which have a track record relative to previous products. Um, to um, their pre-market authorizations or PMAs, which are more complicated processes. These can take many years and involve clinical trials and more complex manufacturing. And what we're finding is, and I'll talk about some of these, some of the things that we've classically thought about as devices um, are in fact regulated um, as drugs or biologics based on um, what the device is doing, and I'll give you an example of that. And once you're in an IND or a BLA, a biologics license application, NDA, new drug application with a drug, uh, with a device, you're treated just like a drug, and that can be a very prolonged um, um, development cycle. But what we're finding is, and if you look at the bottom arrow, the blue arrow at the bottom, that we're, um, we have, over the last several years, been moving from an industry um, that was dominated by largely 510K um, um, pathway um, with minimal clinical data to an increasing demand for clinical evidence. And that can be a 510K with clinical evidence associated with it, which doesn't distinguish it that much from a PMA. The major difference in that case is largely on the manufacturing side and what's submitted as opposed to um, the clinical side. And that has done something in terms of increasing costs, increasing time frames, and increasing uncertainty about how um, a, a particular device is going to be handled. So we're clearly um, facing challenges with this changing landscape of what's going on. One thing that's going on, because of the increased pressures, the need to contain healthcare costs, and healthcare costs are a major um, concern in the United States, is that the threshold for innovation is higher. And what I mean by that is that people say they may be willing to pay for innovation, but what they're willing to pay for to call it innovation has gotten a, to be a higher hurdle. So it has to be a, mar, uh, a much um, greater breakthrough or much greater leap in terms of the kind of product to call it truly innovative if you're on the payer side, which is going to justify a higher cost than already available therapies. And that's how things are measured today. It's, whether, it's not whether a product works, that's important for FDA approval um, or for 510K clearance, but to have it, it's one thing to get approval for a product, it's another thing to have a product sold in the marketplace. And that's um, people, payers, providers are um, asking for a lot more evidence uh, for something that's going to be costly. If you have something that's going to cost a lot of money and, in fact, is going to be incrementally more costly than something else that's already available, um, you have to show not only that it works and that it's safe, you also have to show that there's a cost advantage, an economic incentive that is a value to using the new thing versus the old thing. And that's a hard thing to do at times. Um, the other thing that's been happening increasingly over the last five to seven years is increased global competition. Um, we used to think about China as being a low-cost, low-quality um, developer of products and only developing Me Too products. What we're finding today is that they are lower cost, but they're high quality. They're the quality of some Chinese and uh, products made in India and other parts of the developing world are offering the same quality as products um, that originate in the United States. Uh, but at a lower cost. So that's a real challenge. And uh, the other thing that's a challenge if you're an entrepreneur and you're developing a product is your patent situation. In medical devices, um, it's very common to have a device come out with good patents around it, but within a year have several other devices that are very similar or diagnostics that are very similar but are not in uh, violating the first product's um, 
patent situation. So that's, that can be a challenge. There's clearly pr uh, pricing pressures. I've talked about that. I've also talked about the evolving regulatory requirements and longer development times. But perhaps from the perspective of many in this audience, and again, we'll have panelists addressing this, is that uh, venture capital, which has been a key driver of this industry, is declining in dollars and in deal volume. That's been true for a while. These are numbers from a 2012 survey for the first three quarters of 2012, and there's no reason to think that the fourth quarter of 2012 is going to reverse this. Uh, medical device investing by the venture world has declined for the last three quarters of, uh, in 2012. That's a 37% decline in dollars. That's a lot of money, not available. And a 20% decline in deal volume. So we're seeing less deals being funded, and the ones that are being funded are being funded with less money. Um, $434 million went to just 65 companies. This is the lowest dollar level of investment since 2004. Again, well, well uh, I'll touch on this a little more, but I'm sure people on our panel will speak even more to this and what can be done about this and what you all can do to um, overcome this as a challenge. Even though we're facing this challenging, um, changing landscape, there are opportunities for us. We have not cured all diseases. In fact, not only have we not cured them, there are many conditions that uh, where treatments are available, that the treatments are inadequate. In addition, we're facing an, an increasingly aging population across the globe in many markets, including the U.S. Number two in, in the world in terms of market size is Japan. Um, China, an increasing um, um, growing pop, uh, aging population. So we're seeing that and with age, and I can attest that this is really true, with age comes ailments and um, and things that need treatment, and this is a real opportunity because there's a much larger population out there that will be in need. So there are many unmet medical needs, you know, and, one, um, and, and many of them can be addressed in the medical device and diagnostics arena, including things like diabetes, um, obesity, cancer, um, arthritis, um, and cardiovascular disease. Those are the big five um, chronic diseases, and when you think about the big five chronic diseases and why they're important, one is that they're recurring healthcare costs, so the same patient, the cost doesn't go away when, you, when they come to the doctor. They keep seeing the doctor or they keep having to be rehospitalized. And they, it accounts, these chronic diseases account for about 70% of healthcare costs in the United States. So that if we can approach these with new therapies that are really effective, even if they're a little more expensive, um, we can reduce overall healthcare costs. Um, and I've, I've touched on many of these um, other um, um, areas, but what we are seeing, and I, I mentioned the um, developing world, we are seeing the developing world developing. And China, which is still a developing world, is the number two economy in the U.S. So on economic grounds, it is not a developing country. Uh, but if you go there, you can see that it's still a developing country. They're learning a lot of new things. And uh, this is true. So, and with rising uh, gross domestic product with urbanization, which is occurring in the developing market. We're seeing expanded health care coverage by these countries, which is increasing their costs, but it's also increasing opportunities uh, for medical devices and diagnostics. It's a great opportunity. And one thing I would encourage people to do, because you're going to be competing with them anyway, is to think about your products, not just from a U.S. perspective, but also from a global perspective, particularly in the developing markets. Because what's happening is we're seeing very creative, very innovative um, people, engineers, scientists, physicians, um, business people, addressing medical needs in the developing world with solutions that are very creative, very effective, and at low cost, which easily can be translated and brought over to the United States, and we've seen that in a lot of areas already, you know, in x-ray equipment, for example. So it's something to keep in mind. If we're going to compete, it's not just competing in the U.S., it's competing with global competitors. So what it's going to take, how do we continue to create value in healthcare? You know, well, my belief, and I think it's shared by many, is that we've got to continue to innovate. Despite the challenges we're facing, um, we need to innovate. In this country, the, um, it's very important, and I personally am worried about the consequences of the um, um, ecosystem in the United States, the innovation ecosystem, because the U.S. 
has always been and still is the leading innovating, innovative company, uh, innovative country in medical products. Almost all the advances that have occurred, not all, but most, have occurred from um, out of the U.S., from universities, from entrepreneurs, from industry, and from government. And we are in real danger of losing that because unlike other countries which are investing heavily in certain areas, the U.S. hasn't been doing that. And there are many reasons to think that if we invested in innovation, it would be not only good for the people in this room, it would be good for the entire country. It would help um, stimulate the economy, as I've already mentioned. It would improve the health of, um, of our citizens. And um, if we don't do it, if we are um, left behind, we will really get behind. And there are already some areas, one I already mentioned, regenerative medicine, which is being heavily invested on by governments in, in uh, many different countries, including Singapore, China, Korea, on the Asia, Asia side, um, in Europe, um, the UK and Ireland have been doing a lot of investing, um, Israel, there are lots of places, and these aren't just entrepreneurs and VCs, these are actual government interventions to stimulate research in an area like that, which is a high risk area, which is probably beyond the means of any single company um, to approach it. And I'm just using that as an example, we can come up with many other examples. So what do I mean by innovation? It's the creation of value through something new or different. And we often think of innovation, and largely what I'm going to be talking about is innovation in products and technologies, but there also can be innovation in who your customers are and your markets. I already talked about that in terms of developing world. You can find great growth opportunities just by switching your focus from a, a US-only focus to a international focus, and also a change in business models. And in fact, what we find is that many companies that are small and tiny facing giants ultimately succeed where the giants fall because they not only come up with cool products, they also come up with unique business models um, that are very different than the way the established companies have been operating. So it's again something else to think about when you think about innovating. There's a lot on the product side and on the opportunity side as, of, as I've already mentioned in terms of um, opportunities, things like nanotechnology, uh, microelectronics and sensing. Um, there's a concept of what people call the OR of the future, where there's a combination of um, imaging, um, navigation, knowing where the device is without being invasive, um, and robotics. One of the things that makes devices often very different than drugs is that with drugs, if one doctor writes a prescription and I write a prescription and we give it to the same patient with the same instructions, we'll get the same result. If doctor, the first doctor does an operation and I do an operation, God forbid, the results will be different because of the two doctors having different skill sets. So the skill of the surgeon or the skill of the interventionalist is as big a determinant and probably the biggest determinant of outcomes. So as great as our ideas are and our devices are, you still need the surgeon or the interventionalist to use the device appropriately. That's one thing. The setting also matters. Again, you know, it matters a little bit in pharmaceuticals, but if my office is on one side of town and um, the other doctor's office is on the other side of town, we write the same uh, prescriptions, they go to the same pharmacy, get exactly the same drug, you're going to have the same outcome if it's the same patient. But the operation may not be the same depending on the hospital. So it's not just the patient and what they bring, it's not just the surgeon, it's also the hospital setting and lots of things that happen um, around that. What the OR of the future allows us to think about is taking the skills and the outcomes of the extraordinary surgeon, of the extraordinary physician, and providing that to the ordinary uh, physician or surgeon who doesn't have the same skills by using technology to facilitate um, um, the procedure. Very exciting, I've seen demonstrations. A lot of new hospitals are building these so-called um, ORs of the future. Neurostimulation and, East and uh, electronic stimulation in general is another exciting area in medical devices. 
mechanism-based targeted therapies where we now understand precisely what's going on and we can target more precisely with drugs, but we can also do the same thing with diagnostics, and in fact, diagnostics can be key to that. I've mentioned regenerative medicine, biologics and cell therapy, genomics. Health information technology is going to be very important as we go forward. In fact, many are saying that medicine is quickly becoming an information um, industry, that information is going to be the key to, uh, um, to improvements that we're going to see, and nobody has cracked how to do that. You know, I have e-health and mobile health on there, but patients increasingly are going to have access to information, and they want information to improve the quality of decisions. So do uh, physicians and other clinicians. So that's going to be very important. And you hear the concept of personalized medicine a lot, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and I've got to speed myself along. A lot of the concepts that are in my later slides I'm already um, talking about. But I want to get into the theme of the meeting, um, which is, you know, you need to imagine what's possible. That's that creative inventive act. But I want to talk about collaboration to help drive innovation. And again, that, what is collaborative um, innovation? I'm going to talk about one idea that talks about this, and that idea is called convergence. It's not a term I've come up with. It's a term that's used across many different industries and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what is convergence? I think you all know what I mean. That this line going up on, uh, on the uh, graph is not convergence, it's a single line. But what it's showing is that in order to reach something easy and simple for the end user, whether it's a doctor or a consumer or a patient, the product gets, starts getting more complex. And, and what convergence is, um, defined as, and you can see three different definitions, I think all of them are pretty good, but I'll take B, to come together from different directions and meet. And what we find in convergence, which implies collaboration, you can't have convergence without collaboration, um, is that you take not just technologies, not just different products or different settings and bring them together and learn. You bring different people together. You bring a diversity of different backgrounds and experiences to create something and bring it to reality either more easily or to bring it forward when it wouldn't have gone forward at all if you hadn't brought this, these ideas together. And, you know, there's a great example of it. And, you know, probably at least 50% of the audience has one of these. This is actually an old one. This is an uh, iPhone 3, and now they're up to 5, for those of you who recognize things. Um, but Apple was not in this business. Apple didn't know, wasn't in the phone business. They actually weren't in the, uh, in the, de in the um, um, device business at all. They were a computer company and a software company. But, you know, they had an idea. They had an idea of either understanding what consumers wanted, or Steve Jobs used, Jobs used to say, he had an idea of what consumers wanted before they did. And so to do this, they brought together um, dozens and dozens of collaborators, partners of different industries. They weren't a chip maker, they didn't make the boards, they didn't know the technology, but they had the idea of what it was and they brought it all together and created the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, and the, and the new generation of Macs that uh, we see around. And where's convergence going in, in, health, in healthcare? It begins with these products, and what I'm showing there is a drug-eluting stent. It's a drug on a stent. I'll talk a little bit about that. And systems that is combined, you know, going beyond a particular product to something that's helping doctors, patients, and others um, learn more, um, get educated, and help them get direction through websites, for example, and other kinds of e-health that help them with the devices. So it's, it's a more encompassing thing to this idea of a truly patient-centered outcome where the solution is what the patient needs, and it may be a combination of different things that you have to bring together, of which a device or a drug or a diagnostic may play a role, but there are a lot of other things that could be important in that. I'm going to skip some of these because I've got to get myself forward. Um, so in terms of convergence, um, we're seeing drug-device um, combinations, biologics-device combinations, we're seeing diagnostics coupled with drugs or devices or with drug-device combinations. And we're seeing diagnostics used for personal, 
personalized medicine. And almost by nature, if you're talking about personalized medicine, is combining diagnostics information in a way that can be customized and made specific as possible for a unique individual, if that's what we mean by personalized medicine, it is almost by definition convergence and collaboration because you got to couple the diagnostic prognostic information with the therapeutic information. I think again our panelists may talk about that. These are just two examples from Johnson & Johnson's the cipher stent where the drug improves the device and it was regulated as a device. Or here you see an auto injector uh, for a product called Symphony that's used in arthritis and Crohn's disease and some other conditions where a device is used to improve the biologic. This is a way a patient very easily can administer the drug themselves to themselves and I can attest to this one. Not only was I part of the development of this, but unbeknownst to me when this product was under development, my wife is, uh, and unknown to her, my wife developed a condition that is requiring this and she treats herself every um, several weeks with this device. I'm a doctor, she's not, but she does this on her own. She doesn't want me involved. Okay, um, I'm um, going to skip through some of these, but I do want to talk about diagnostics. Um, diagnostics can be used in predicting who's going to get sick, um, in selecting the appropriate treat treatment, in the management of patients, in screening of patients who may be at risk or identifying higher risk patients, and in diagnosis. They are very important, and diagnostics, very interestingly, although they're used at least 70 to 80 percent of the time in help in being critical in the treatment management of a patient or um, in helping somebody manage their risks, it, they contribute today only about 2% of total healthcare costs. The biggest challenge with diagnostics from an innovator's standpoint is nobody wants to pay, everybody wants them and nobody wants to pay for them. Um, so they don't, they, they're not getting um, in return the value they're delivering. Um, and I think we're going to talk about some of these things in the molecular diagnostics and other things. So I'm not going to spend uh, time on these. This is an example of a cellular diagnostic that was developed by Johnson & Johnson to help in, in uh, selecting specific treatment um, for cancer patients. Um, this is another example of combining a biologic with, um, with a um, device. It, um, traditionally, hemostasis, that is hemostatics, that things that stop bleeding, it was um, gauze pads and things like that, and the hand, compression. Uh, we now have um, biologics that are active that don't only rely, bleeding doesn't stop just because something mechanical is done. It's because you add something, in this case proteins, uh, like thrombin or fib fibrin or fibrinogen or all three, um, that help seal. And that's just a direct application of the biologic. And now, and this is being done by Ethicon um, in, um, or in, at Johnson & Johnson, is adding a biologic to something that looks sort of like a gauze or, or a pad, a matrix, a synthetic matrix, with a protein on it that leads to a dramatic reduction or control of bleeding compared to the old stuff. This is a um, drug, uh, this is a biologic device combination. The actual mechanical thing is the device. Um, but it's regulated as a, as a biologic, and therefore what was needed to get it um, through the approval process were the things you have to do with a biologic approval. And we're going to see that increasingly. This is about um, improvements related to regenerative medicine. Um, the problem with convergence and collaboration is it's not easy to do. It requires higher funding and resources, um, which means that it tries to pull people away from what they're already doing. Um, so they're often under-resourced. Um, and they add risk to the base business if you have other things you're doing and you pull them into convergence, um, into collaboration, um, you're pulling those resources away from what they're typically doing when they're doing one thing and that, that provides some risk. They also require unique skills and t uh, knowledge and technologies, but it really the secret to this is collaboration. It re means aligned incentives for all the people who are working together. And that's, it's easier said than done. I know that from experience. So what does it take? You need to have a good product development strategy. It means having the right people the right place. But um, you have to have excellence as we traditionally have in um, devices, in engineering, biology, chemistry, biologics, perhaps, and clinical development. But you know the new things are clinical development. We need more clinicals today, regulatory things 
workforce manufacturing, but also today, because of the value equation, you've got to start thinking about what are the health economic um, consequences of what I'm doing that will help drive um, reimbursement. So this idea of value creation is uh, really important. Um, all the stakeholders in healthcare, and that includes patients, the public, um, but also regulators, payers, physicians, other clinicians, hospitals, um, are asking for more evidence that something works. They're not willing to just say, cool device, the surgeon wants to use it, it's used. That was the old model. Cool idea by the engineer, um, the, with the, working with the surgeon, working with the physician, and they got it approved in a couple of years. That doesn't happen anymore. People want to know, if you, they're paying for it, they want to know, why should I use this? Rather than that, even if the surgeon isn't asking that question, and we're fortunate to have a, um, a um, hospital um, CEO here, it, they're asking that question. What is the value? Should we pay for it? P safety is also being um, scrutinized for um, evidence. So what evidence do you need, and when is it needed? Well, the problem is everyone has a different perspective on this. Policymakers, payers, the FDA, um, the people who are providing the clinical service, whether it's physicians, nurses, chiropractors. And certainly the patient often has a different perspective than everybody else about what's important to them. And the problem is in meeting the needs of all these people, it's increasing our costs, it's increasing our risk. So how do we do it? Um, there is a model, and I want to go over it quickly, and I'll probably stop right after this. And I want to talk about, and I think you guys might remember the crash, um, um, dummies here. The, um, I'm not talking about the um, about the band, but you know they used to show this on TV with with the dummy responding. And the advantage of what you see there, the big white thing, is an airbag. Well, airbags were introduced into cars before we had scientific evidence of their long-term uh, improvement and long-term outcomes. Um, they were introduced initially in a few GM vehicles. I think Cadillac was the first. And what we learned as we had it in the marketplace in what people call the real world, not what's learned in controlled experiments, but in the real world use, is in fact there were problems with airbags. In fact, the early airbags occasionally um, cause fatalities because of the ways they inflated um, and the pressures they caused and their configuration, the geometry. But what we also learned is that they saved a lot more lives than they took. And what we learned in the real world was what improvements we had to make to make them better and make them safer. And now the, new, the latest generation of airbags, and they've been evolving, is that they're surrounding the entire vehicle on the inside. And they do very much less harm and a whole lot of good, particularly when you wear a seatbelt. As you can see, the dummy's also wearing a seatbelt. So can we apply this kind of reasoning to healthcare? And I think we can, in an, in an innovation model which, where we need to know about safety and efficacy for approval, but also to get reimbursement, to get people to pay for it. But the question is, how much safety, how much efficacy? In other words, put it in statistical terms, what's the upper confidence limit that we need to exclude safe, uh, important safety events, that we've excluded we know that within a certain range, it's this safe. We haven't gotten it precisely, but we know that at least we've excluded in one out of, depending on the condition, one out of 1,000, one out of 100, one out of 10,000 people of having anything really deleterious occurring. And you can get more information as you go, like we did with the airbags. And then what's the lower confidence limit for efficacy? We know it's at least this good. It may be better, but we know it's at least this good. And then what you do. So that should be enough to get it moved along and through the, you know, into the market with a commitment by the developers, the company, to continue to learn, to continue to get information. The answer of how much depends on the series of the condition, their relative unmet need. So if you have a serious condition, but there's plenty of things out there for it, you know, you're probably not, in a, you're probably going to be, have a lot more scrutiny on something new. But if you have something very serious where there really aren't any good treatments, you might say, as long as I know that it's this effective and this safe, that's good enough and we'll learn a lot more in the real world. Because the problem is in randomized trials, because of all the controls put on them, we often don't know how it's actually going to perform in the real world. Um, 
So, you know, I've written here this idea of convergence and collaboration for innovation in what people call a learning healthcare system. And that's where everybody, rather than pointing fingers at each other about what's wrong, which is what happens today, work together with the patient in the middle. Um, pay, um, that means clinicians, it means the, provi the other providers, the hospital systems, and industry regulators, policy makers. So this is you know, the idea of what we can strive for. <clears throat> it's not easy, but what it does mean, I'm going to go to my very last slide. Um, is that we need to see collaboration across traditional boundaries. It's difficult, it's much easier not to collaborate, but the payoff is much greater if you do. So we need collaboration within universities. I used to be in a university. I know collaborations in the same department is sometimes hard. Between universities, within companies, it's hard within companies across boundaries, and between companies, with and all of them, the companies, the universities, others working with government agencies, we'll hear about how you can do that with FDA, with payers and with patients, with hospitals, to get a freer flow of ideas, people and money across traditional boundaries so that we can innovate and really see the possibilities that are in front of us. And if we can collaborate together, not only in the products, but also in the healthcare system, we, we, I truly believe we can continue to drive innovation, but also because we're making improvements, bring down um, healthcare um, costs. Thank you. So we'll uh, we'd like to, at this point, uh, award uh, Harlan with uh, an award of appreciation for all that he's contributed to uh, medical device innovation from Johns Hopkins through J&J &J, through his work in congressional committees, and also now back at uh, private practice as a consultant. So uh, if you. Uh, and if I could ask the panelists to come on stage, no good deed goes unpunished. The hall is going to moderate. First thing I'd like to do, and I'm very excited to have this panel. First question to each of the panelists although they have their name tags here, it's hard for you to uh, read it out there, is if you could each say, you know, who you are and what you do and um, in a, maybe in a sentence or two why innovation is important to you or, or the uh, evolving uh, innovation um, um, environment that we, uh, ecosystem that we want to change. So why don't I start here? Uh, I'm Bob DePola, uh, and I appreciate uh, the invite to come to come here. I think this is very important. I'm the director of the Cancer Institute in New Jersey. You probably, or most of you know this, it is one of the uh, the U.S.'s uh, 41 comprehensive uh, cancer centers designated by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and, th and this effort, and this program, uh, and certainly, um, you know, moving forward is important because, you know, we do this all the time. I mean, we have on one end of the center multidisciplinary clinics where we're seeing patients on the other end, research activities, uh, and really engage in this translational activity of applying the research technologies toward the patients. So obviously medical devices is included as well as the therapeutics. So anyway, look forward to being Good morning. My name is Stephen Jones. I'm the president of Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and the Robert Wood Johnson Health System. We have five hospitals in our system, 1.2 billion in revenue. The university hospital is a 600-bed academic medical center in partnership with Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, the Rutgers College of Nursing, the Rutgers College of Pharmacy, and I appreciate the chance to participate. I'm Joachim Kohn. I believe I'm the only faculty member on this panel. I probably got invited because I've started four uh, companies. Uh, and my, license, my licenses have generated uh, probably over, the, over a million dollars for Rutgers so far, and more than 30,000 patients today carry my inventions in their body. So we have gone all the way uh, from the bed to the marketplace, and I think that's why I'm here. And I, I look forward to sharing some of these experiences with you. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? My name is Steve Brozak. I'm the president of WBB Securities. We're uh, I guess, according to the ranking systems, probably the most successful firm in terms of recommendation performance. 
over the last two years by most of the systems in biotech, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices. We've invested about a billion dollars, or I shouldn't say that. We've asked our clients to invest about a billion dollars uh, over the last, uh, I don't know how many years. We've been doing stem cell advisory research for about 17 years now, which makes us probably the old man on the hill. Uh, and uh, I know why I was invited. I'm not sure if I'll be invited back after what I say today, so um, I'll be happy to answer questions in detail afterwards. Good morning. I'm Megan Moynihan. I'm the Assistant Director for Technology and Innovation <coughs> at FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health, and I have no idea why I was invited to come here. Um, in my role at, at, uh, at FDA, I am uh, uh, working on the Innovation Pathway, which is a streamlined program for bringing innovative medical devices forward. And I also direct the Entrepreneurs in Residence program, which brings <coughs> outside thinkers into the FDA so that we can help develop these new programs. Um, we see the innovation ecosystem as something that's in distress right now. Uh, if we were a company, this would be like our customer base fleeing, going overseas for their clinical trials and developing uh, and marketing their, their uh, devices outside the U.S. before coming to the, to the U.S., and so we would like to win back our customers. Hi, I'm uh, Tony Diamond. I represent the entrepreneurial side of uh, the medical uh, device um, industry. Um, I'm the founder of a group called uh, Nason Enterprises. Uh, Nason consists of um, six healthcare professionals, two are surgeons, two are scientists, one is a sales and marketing expert, and I have a financial background, having been the uh, CFO of a publicly traded medical device company. Um, in my career, I've collaborated with 23 medical device startups. Uh, we took four of those public, sold 10, uh, one of which was a company uh, here in New Jersey called Vital Signs that I met um, <clears throat> the founder when the company was uh, a neophyte. He and I um, built it from um, under 10 million in sales to 250 million and sold it to uh, GE Medical for 900 million. <clears throat> so um, there is, a, uh, as <clears throat> Harlan pointed out, um, there's a, a great deal of stress in the uh, financial marketplace in terms of um, financing uh, startups, and I think this panel and this uh, session is very appropriate <clears throat> to look at the opportunities that still can be achieved. So I appreciate the uh, invitation of joining you. Thank you. And you can see now, by having heard the brief comments, why I'm so uh, excited and, and pleased that um, we have this group of individuals. And I'm, I'm confident that um, as you hear them speak um, in response to my questions, but even more importantly in response to yours, um, we'll all learn uh, quite a bit. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to throw out some questions, um, and I'm not going to go down the order. Uh, uh, I'm just going to do it somewhat randomly. And um, so I'm going to start with you, Steve, because I, you know, was trying to be optimistic, but when I talked about the, um, the VC world and the investing and the current outlook of how easy it is to uh, invest in companies now, um, you know, I wasn't as, um, I wasn't painting a, a, a bright situation today. I'm wondering whether you can comment on that and what you see as, you know, what's emerging in terms of what we can expect in terms of products and uh, from your perspective, um, if, if you see a, a bunch of entrepreneurs out there, what would you tell them? Okay, I have to credit my wife for basically saying I have to stop, start with something Let, optimistic. Why don't you move the uh, microphone a little closer? I have to start with something optimist, on an optimistic note. So I won't be as august and, and quote uh, Dickens, I'll go to the Maltese Falcon. Um, last, since it was playing last night, this is the stuff that dreams are made of, okay? And um, I'd like a show of hands here, very unscientific, but how many people really believe that the capital markets are efficient? Okay, you're wrong. <coughs> Looks like someone from Wall Street is paying attention to me here. Um, no, what we believe are, and why we can say this is, they actually do respond to incentives. 
that circle that you saw there all were different incentives. The questions are, how do you change those incentives to make sure that you get the proper outcome? How do you make sure that a large medical device company makes the correct decision, not for that short-term earnings per share goal, but to actually get out a device that in the long run is going to make them much, much more money, but in the short run is going to take time to basically provide for uh, ad uh, adoption by the medical community, by the clinicians, and by the patients. How do you achieve that? Because what you've got now is a situation where the incentivization process is working remarkably <coughs> well. Bankers get paid to do deals. But I'll tell you, between all the VCs, the private equity people, the capital markets, here's what they all want. They want something that's going to provide them with a 10-bagger, 10 times their money, they want it to basically be pretty much risk-free. Oh, yeah. And they want profitability within a year. That universe is pretty much zero. Now, here's what you're seeing. And you always should follow the money. The money is being returned. Fund managers are going back out there, and they're putting money back. Why? Because they can't invest enough. The other problem, the really, really good ideas, the really, really good projects are so small, they don't need hundreds of millions of dollars. In some cases, they don't even need tens of millions of dollars. They just need millions of dollars. And that's where we see things like the exciting part, serendipity, the breakthrough projects. That researcher that finds something that is counterintuitive and says, hey, why is this working this way? Wall Street doesn't understand that. And I'll let the next person speak on this note. About six weeks ago, I was asked to do an op-ed, OK? Why Wall Street is more important than any other segment. Because we provide the incentives to go out there. The op-ed stated that if a company misses their earnings per share, that's more devastating than going out there and launching a product or whatever. I had five rewrites to try and explain what EPS was. Five rewrites. Number six, I said, no, no longer. There's a disconnect. And as long as we have that disconnect to Wall Street, there are going to be some problems. By the end of this discussion, I'd like to tell you what I think a solution might be. Thank, thank you. Um, certainly food for thought about what we can do to um, fix, fix our ecosystem. Um, Dr. Cohn, you're somebody who um, is not only a faculty member, but a, a successful entrepreneur. Um, could you give your, your perspective on, you know, given the opportunities we face now that I talked about and um, in terms of the aging population, the many baby boomers who are um, reaching retirement or well into retirement, and all the many unmet medical needs, um, all the great technologies we can tap into, how do you do it? You've been successful. What, what would you say to this group? Uh, thank you. Um, the, I, think, uh, I think when I look around, the, uh, the single most important medical need is defined by the fact that our ability to live longer has outpaced our ability to live healthy lives. So too many of us end up with debilitating um, ailments that can be as primitive as urinary incontinence, devastates your uh, quality of life, yet could be treated by a 30 milligram muscle replacement. Um, all the way to macular degeneration, blindness, uh, Alzheimer. Uh, so what I think is, our, our, uh, we are trying to, medic, traditional medical technology has extended our lifespan. And now regenerative medicine and innovations in uh, medical practice have to provide us with uh, the increased quality of life so the the lifespan can be used productively now um, uh, when we go when we think about uh, the uh, the marketplace however I want to mention that the second important qualifier for this line of products that you can envision that help us increase our quality of life uh, there has to be a premium on cheap rather than innovative. 
we, I think uh, you don't have to be a prophet to understand that we are probably here in the United States move rapidly into a system like the managed care system in, the Un in uh, Great Britain, where, by the where you have annual budgets for certain operations, especially elective surgeries. And by October, or if, if you're unlucky, by July, the budget is expended. And you have to wait till next budget year to get your elective surgery because there's just no money to do it. Now, in that kind of environment, a premium will be paid for effective therapies that cut costs, not necessarily innovative therapies that cost a lot. So these are the two points I, would, I thought I want to contribute to this question. Thank you. So, um, Megan, you, you said why were you invited. You wondered why you were invited. And, um, I'll tell you why. I've, I've done panels similar to this in the past, and the first couple, there was nobody from FDA there, and it becomes a really very aligned panel um, because everyone is saying, th well, if you fix the FDA, things would be a lot better. Um, and um, one thing I, I think you can tell by looking at Megan, and I, I shook her hand and I can vouch for this, she doesn't have horns, she's not evil, and she's well-intended. Um, and I, over the years in my career in pharmaceuticals, biologics, working with CBER, working with CEDAR, the Center for Drugs, and, um, and uh, with CDRH, um, most recently in my career, the, the uh, Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, what I've learned is that you have um, very, uh, for the most part, you have very well-intended individuals um, but there is often a failure of good communication on both sides, and that is the um, FDA could do things to improve their communications. Uh, but clearly, and one of the first things I do, I'm now a consultant with many different companies and also government organizations uh, beyond the other work I do, and um, one of the first questions I ask when I'm meeting with a company, particularly a startup company, but also in large companies, is what discussions have you had with the FDA? And the first, they, usually the answer is none or minimal. Um, and second, there's an assumption of what the FDA's position is going to be, and it's, it's always very onerous. And also the assumption that they can't get a meeting. So one of the reasons I wanted to have Megan come, and, and uh, this is going to turn into a question, um, is um, you mentioned the great interest that the FDA has in in improving uh, the innovation ecosystem. And there are a lot of things going on at CDRH that I'm aware of, and I'm sure there's a lot more um, that CDRH is doing to help um, um, startup companies, um, early inventors, entrepreneurs, as well as established companies along the path to accelerate innovation to the marketplace. So Megan, uh, tell us about all that. Sure, thank you. Thank you, and thank you again for inviting me. Um, you know, we've been watching also the innovation, the medical device innovation ecosystem, and we have some concerns about it. What we see from our angle is a lot of clinical trials being done overseas because people don't want to come through the FDA. We're seeing innovative medical devices put on the market in Europe first and then coming to the U.S. later. Um, you know, one of the, we, as I said before, if we were a company, this would be like our customer base fleeing in droves. It's going to be really important for us to understand what it's going to take to win back uh, medical de U.S. medical device companies to bring their products forward. What can we be doing to be the regulatory agency of choice for companies who have a choice? Um, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty big charge. Um, so, you know, one way to think about uh, the FDA is th if you can think about us in two ways. One is we really do have to have almost a production line model for moving medical applications through. You have to kind of demand of the FDA that it become a better factory, okay, that we are more consistent and that we are more predictable so that you can plug and play us into your business plan with, uh, you know, some assurance about, uh, you know, how long things are going to take and the approximate outcome that you're going to get. So I think it's okay that we think of the FDA as a, a little bit of a factory um, and that you demand better performance from, from us. Some of the laws that were recently put into place through FIDASIA um, that were signed um, back in July are things that are going to help us improve our consistency and predictability in, in our overall performance. But 
uh, you also have to demand of the FDA to be the kind of uh, place where you can have almost concierge level service for people who are struggling to understand the basics. Um, you know, it's fine that we can process 95% of our applications very rapidly through, but for that game changer that comes along, that, that innovative medical device that has the potential to address an unmet public health need, something that changes the game for science for us, or maybe brings in a new clinical um, trials paradigm, or maybe sort of breaks the mold of our, 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 our usual regulatory thinking, we need a special process to handle those kinds of things. So the innovation pathway program that I'm developing is intended to be that. It's intended to be the special program where we just say out loud, okay, we're going to treat some companies differently. We're going to give them a different level of service because they are innovative, because they're going to address an unmet public health need, and that's important to us. So we're trying to build both models. We're trying Trying to, um, we're trying to get the factory model better. We process 10,000 pre-market applications a year, so we have to get better and more consistent. Um, we also have to uh, look at the problem differently. It's not just about FDA pedaling faster on the inside. Okay, It's about looking at the total time that it takes to get from concept to commercialization and trying to figure out where are the points of engagement where FDA has an impact on the total time and where do, can we just have some influence over that ecosystem. So it's a combination of what can we actually do in our own business processes internally? What can we do to influence the overall ecosystem? Um, innovation Pathway is, is intended to, to do that. So we have three companies right now moving on this newly built, what we call Innovation Pathway, where our goals are to um, shorten the total time it takes from concept to commercialization for their products, and also to transform the experience of what it's like for innovators and FDA working together. We're trying to create a one-team model where everyone sees themselves aiming toward the same goal where the adversarial approach is sort of broken down. We have a lot of tools that we put into place to, to facilitate that. Um, so uh, those are the kinds of things that we're doing. We're doing it in conjunction with our entrepreneurs and residents, bringing outside people in to help us think about the problem differently. So you can hope to see uh, some, some cultural shifting on the inside as well as some pragmatic, practical changes in our overall regulations and goals. Thank you, Mayor. Arlen, uh, can I chime in for a second on the FDA? Uh, I had a recent experience. I've been in the healthcare field for over 30 years, and recently one of the companies that I'm working with, actually here at Rutgers, <clears throat> was uh, confronted with a serious question of survival if they had to do a long clinical trial. So we appealed to the FDA to see if there was an accelerated path through a 510K, and remarkably, the FDA came back to us and gave us two what are known as predicates to be able to accelerate the process to the marketplace. So uh, to me, it was a very refreshing experience that I thought everyone should hear of. And I congratulate my uh, friend here, Megan, for being part of that uh, new thought process. So, um, so Tony, since you spoke up, I'll, I'll ask you the next question. But one thing I, I just wanted to mention on the same note that uh, I spent actually in, in my consulting, uh, when I wear my consulting hat, um, I spent a lot of time on the um, CDRH website. Um, and uh, any of you out there, how many of you have gone to the, the website recently, not, not historically? So there are a few of you. I really suggest you do that because there are actually um, a lot of tools there, a lot of how-tos, from a very basic level to a level for people who want to really get into the details of what the um, Code, of Feder Code of Federal Regulations actually says or the guidelines, but there are simplified uh, versions of that. It's become much more user-friendly in the past. I find it much easier uh, myself um, today um, to interact just with the, that website. Um, Tony, you just alluded to one of your experiences, and, and in your introduction, you mentioned um, a whole host of um, companies that you've been involved in, some you've brought public, um, um, some you've, um, you've um, sold to um, other businesses. Um, can you talk about um, if we have any um, burgeoning entrepreneurs out there and they're um, tinkering in their garage or in their laboratory? When is the time that they ought to start thinking about taking that idea, which is a, um, a science fair project, and turning it into something that can actually be a product? Maybe out of the um, broad and vast experience that you've had, you can 
give us some insight or give the audience some insight into this? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, of the 23 companies that I collaborated with, uh, roughly a third came from universities. And within those <clears throat> universities, there were scientists and surgeons who frankly, <clears throat> actually the, uh, the name of my firm, Nascent, uh, came from an operating uh, experience that one of my partners was in the OR and the surgeon said to my partner, look at that, that's a nascent vein, a, a nascent capillary. So newly discovered <clears throat> is the concept that we uh, created and we linked science to the commercial world. Uh, there is um, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the evolution of ideas comes from the user, the surgeon, the, the scientist, <clears throat> the embellisher of uh, engineering talent. And what I find at the university level is if the university can uh, encourage creation, creative ideas and bring those creative ideas to the marketplace, the critical issue is survival. How do you survive? How do you come from a concept to uh, ultimately a good product for the marketplace? It has to be a collaboration, and I think this is the theme that you <coughs> pointed out, Marlon, a collaboration between science and industry. I'll give you a, a small example. <clears throat> At NYU, uh, there's a surgeon and a um, PhD physicist who have created a very innovative approach uh, for a knee implant that will essentially delay the need for a total knee. And the other interesting part about this invention is it could be done by sports medicine surgeons very quickly rather than reconstruction surgeons over a longer period of time and much ch more cheaply. Uh, but they couldn't get a venture firm to give them 10 seconds of time, couldn't find investors, and the idea was stalled. So the, the encouragement that we uh, created with the, uh, the team at NYU was to look for an industry partner. And we found one that actually was launching a, uh, or, or increasing their sports medicine orthopedic capacity. So the marriage between industry and science and university and finance <coughs> helped to get this product into the marketplace. Uh, the ideas that are, um, <coughs> Here at Rutgers, I've worked with uh, Dr. Cohn on, uh, in his Biomaterials Institute. <clears throat> the collaboration that he's done with industry is brilliant. So what, I, uh, what needs to be done is <clears throat> to, to connect a science team with a experienced commercial team. That, that's critical because anybody who's going to write a check to under to fund that project and wants to know that the team has done this once before or multiple times before. Also, the beginning of an idea needs to be linked to the exit of the idea. So you don't wait five years to find a buyer. My, my advice is to create the idea with the end user in mind. Who, will want to use, who would want to have this new idea? Johnson & Johnson, Zimmer, <coughs> GE Medical, Think through the exit as you begin the entrance. That's, a, uh, I think, a, uh, a very important element. Thank you. Um, you know, during my presentation toward the um, end, I sped through a lot of what I was going to say about um, diagnostics and particularly around um, the concept of um, personalized health, um, targeted health, precision health, because I um, was not only out of time, I was borrowing time from this panel, but most importantly, I knew that uh, Bob DePaula was here and could do uh, a far better job than I could to talk about the subject of personalized health. Could you, um, Bob, even define what that means and, and what you see as the promise and perhaps the challenges of pers personalized medicine or precision medicine? Absolutely, and I agree with you. Very, very important. Um, and even, you know, I think uh, this is a, a personalized medicine, and I can tell you at the Cancer Institute we call it precision medicine. Um, uh, and I know it's being coined that way in a number of different places. 
um, you know, is really trying to get at the heart of how we make therapies more effective in, in all aspects, in terms of in cancer, obviously, uh, trying to deal with their disease, in terms of prevention, uh, identifying uh, individuals that might uh, have strategies in terms of prevention differently than a different individual, um, and using um, all of the resources that we have in technology applied to that. Um, you know, I, I think um, uh, Dr. Weissman did, a, did an incredible job in, in putting together this, especially that one slide of the, the collaboration required and, and teams required. Um, and I think what we've been fortunate to have is you know, a situation within a cancer center, within a university, and now going into Rutgers University, the kind of collaboration that relates to both the clinical end, dealing with the patient end and the research, uh, and the technology end, uh, and, you know, and research end, and then linking that, also collaborating, obviously, with, with industry in terms of those opportunities. Um, in terms of precision medicine, I mean, what we're seeing now, you know, at least in oncology, and it's, and it's analogous in many different areas, um, is really the evolving kind of combination of how we assess patients, imaging, uh, tissue analysis, looking at molecular biology, looking at genetic changes, um, and then applying that to guide therapeutics. So we've actually formed even teams now. We actually have a precision medicine team. And you talk about collaboration, that team goes from those that are expert on the technology end in terms of imaging, so in terms of the diagnosis, those that are expert on acquiring tissue to actually get a diagnosis, doing the analysis of tissue, so sequencing, gene sequencing, identifying mutations, and then physicians on the other end of the table making decisions on how targeted therapeutics might best fit. Um, and if you think that it doesn't fit with, um, with uh, you know, medical devices, think about how a lot of the research that's going on, in fact, collaborations within the Cancer Center and the School of Engineering include looking at taking imaging and informing it computationally based on the actual tissue findings. So what you have from the beginning to the end is trying to improve diagnosis, identify very individual characteristics of the tumor, genetic changes, target therapies. We've been doing therapeutics for a long time. Um, and if anyone questions whether or not this is emerging and now, um, you, you can take a look at some of the drugs that are coming out of uh, uh, much of pharma uh, including, you know, even recently there was a, you know, an inhibitor of BRAF, you know, in melanoma, um, where it's only effective essentially uh, in tumors that have one specific mutation in one specific gene in that patient's tumor, and essentially ineffective if they don't. So we're there, um, and what you're talking about is a team. In fact, we have our tumor board this afternoon. It's a it's a precision medicine tumor board, and all of those components are sitting at the table, everybody from the imaging end to the technology end to the sequencing end to our computational biologists to the physicians uh, on, the, on the therapeutic end. So what I'd say just in, in, in conclusion is, is that, you know, this perhaps is a, is a bit of a paradigm where you could do what I, I think Stephen had pointed out, and that is look for something that's of much higher impact and then target strategically the medical device development toward that process. So meaning if strategically the higher impact is better diagnosis, individualizing therapy to get to a better cure, and obviously I do believe that we need multi-targeted therapy, probably just not a single agent, how do you then apply uh, this activity, meaning development and innovation in medical devices along that particular continuum? So just a bit of a higher level, talking a bit about hit, hitting uh, bigger impact um, and, uh, and then obviously that would translate or should translate uh, to more effective use long term uh, for, those, uh, for those medical devices, uh, you know, kind of along that uh, particular continuum. Thank you. Um, Stephen Jones, uh, you know, one of the um, things that we've been seeing over the last several years, and I, and I um, touched on it in terms of the evolution of, of healthcare, is that we're moving from a system in which many physicians, surgeons were um, individual entrepreneurs working, you know, at a hospital but working for themselves to um, an increase in seeing more integrated health systems. You're somebody who um, is responsible not only for a hospital but also, also for a healthcare system. And with that, what we're seeing um, are tremendous pressures uh, on um, healthcare costs and certainly one of the biggest drivers of healthcare costs is having a patient in a hospital. And um, there's a big trend to try to get patients out of the hospital more quickly, but what we're also seeing as a result of that is we're seeing rehospitalizations 
because maybe patients are being discharged too quickly. So everybody wants to decre decrease costs, and we know how to measure dollars, but everybody also wants to um, improve outcomes, and that's a harder thing to do. So in this new age of this evolution, um, where do you see where we are, and what are your hopes for, um, for the future? And maybe you could touch on how does innovation play into this? Um, Dr. Weissman, I think your comments earlier about the uh, about difficult, challenging times, but huge opportunity, you know, is, is exactly where we are. Um, as we look forward, there's no question the cost of health care is unsustainable. There's no question that we need innovation in how we deliver care, how doctors and hospitals work together. Textbooks said years ago, we shouldn't be in the bed business, we should be in the health business. I don't think we believed it 20 years ago. It's crystal clear today that we will be paid for value. Doctors and hospitals need to work to promote wellness. And there's lots of examples of that. And the need for innovation, the need for devices, is even more today, but as several of the speakers, you, Dr. Cohen, said, we're going to be paid for value. It's, we're long past cost plus. Today we get paid for fee for service. That is, do more, get paid more. We know we won't be paid for that tomorrow. And, and several speakers have talked about um, that innovation frequently increased costs. We're not going to be paid more, but there's, in my words, lots of money in the system if doctors and hospitals work with other partners strategically and provide care in a better setting at a lower cost, that value is critical and innovation is an important part of that. Thank you. And uh, it really does appear that the theme chosen for this meeting of collaborative innovation was a very good one, a very timely one. I have lots of other questions, but I'm not going to ask anymore. I want to ask the audience um, to ask some questions. We have people with microphones. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. We don't have a lot of time. I'll try to be as democratic as I can. Back all the way. And there's also one up here in the front. Yeah. I came a few minutes late, so I apologize if it was addressed already. But I'm interested in hearing the panel's opinion on the impending excise tax and what impact that's going to have on innovation and even potential strategies. Is there a um, Yep. Please, Steve. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's already been baked in. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Every single Wall Street analyst has basically figured a model for that. Um, but what they're looking at right now, and one of the points that I wanted to talk about and actually put a positive note to it is a lot of companies, smaller especially, have started to look at partnering, not traditional partnering, but partnering, for instance, with the government. HHS has gone out there and they've bent on something, not just with the uh, pharmaceutical biotech industry, but they've also bent on partnering with devices to go out there and say, what are dual purpose items? What can be used for something that's exotic, doesn't happen often, but can also be used for everyday situations that's novel? We just saw the first stem cell company, a device company, being given a contract not a grant, but a contract, if they basically go out there and meet X, Y, and Z, the United States government will actually buy a next generation stem cell product. And that's something that's different. This product can be used for other things, but the government has said, okay, here's the story. Now, the excise penalty. People have built in what happens with taxation. What happens if you see a government private program work? then all of a sudden you're going to start to see behavior where the VCs, the private equity people, these people may come back. And that's one key that I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Um, I want to give other people in the audience a chance, but anyone else on the panel want to comment on that question? Okay, there was a gentleman here I saw that. I follow the intellectual property side when you talk about the globalization and... Um, the, most of the countries at this point in time are members of the PCT, uh, Patent Cooperation Treaty members, and in principle they are supposed to abide by the rules of PCT and supposed to honor the patents. What I'm seeing right now is for expensive drugs, certainly like biologics, uh, when you have the patent in force, say particularly in India right now, there are cases where 
they practice and then those drugs are being used, in a sense you can call it as a patent infringement. And uh, even though it's not an, from a business monetary point of view may not be a serious issue, but in principle this is an issue people want to take care of. And right now uh, companies like Novartis went to court in uh, Supreme Court in India and the recent case for one of the biologics cancer drugs, the country overruled and then it is an tried that they can practice in India in spite of the fact that the patent is still valid. My question to you in the devices side and the diagnostics, now you talked about the globalization and the quality of products made all over the world, similar and all this being the case. How do you see the patent rights to the devices that you have in U.S. being able to enforce it worldwide? And do you see an issue coming from countries where they may not honor this? And I have a second question, which is the... <laughs> well, let, let's do one at a time, okay. because I'm afraid we'll run out of time. Um, you know, that's something, an area that I've had some experience in, but I want to ask um, panel members, uh, any of you um, like to comment on that, the internet, the globalization situation, and particularly protecting your IP when you right. go into these new markets? Okay, I'll... I, all right. Having paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in IP expenses. You know, it depends on who you are. If you're Becton Dickinson, you better believe nobody's going to screw with you, okay? That's the reality. If you are a small company that has an innovative medical device that's basically just meeting payroll, you better expect to have challenges in places where you're manufacturing. And there are ways around everything, and it's up to the gods and the courts to decide whether or not you win and how long you basically have to fight it out. So the realistic answer is it depends on who you are. It depends on who's selling your product. It depends on a lot of things. As far as the Europeans go, we've never had a problem. But, you know, if you're a small company and going out there, and all of a sudden I'm seeing a bill saying that I have to translate this patent into Greek, into Lithuanian, into Latvian, you know, it's like, at some point you're going to start to say no, no, and no. Here are the countries I'm going to pay for, here's what I'm going to do. So the answer is, if you have a strong patent with a strong franchise behind you, you are more equal than others. Um, you know, the other thing I would add is you have to have the patents in those countries, too. You know, I, I gave the example of the Cypher Stem, which was broadly protected in, in a major markets, except <clears throat> it wasn't protected in China that's because at the time, China wasn't a big market. It was nothing. You know, we didn't take it seriously. And, uh, uh, you know, a competitor came up from China and had the patents. So you have to file the patents where you think they're going to be important, and that's costly. So you have to be strategic about what, where does it really matter. The other thing I would say, and I'll, I'll use China as an example, China in 2005, 2006 was a place you really had to worry about. You had to worry about being there bringing on employees because the employees weren't going to stay with you. They would exit and they would go start their own business once they learned yours. Um, plus the patents weren't being enforced. China is now a real global player and wants to sell products in the United States. And they want the U.S. market. They are um, rapidly becoming sophisticated and rapidly enforcing, but you do have to, like everything else, develop relationships. India is another story, and I'm quite frankly, I'm worried about that. I think. India is on a bad track. They have the laws. They have the British court system. They have everything there, and it's willful um, violation. And a lot of big companies are, that moved in there very eagerly and moved there before China are moving out because of the issue that you mentioned. There's a question right here. I have a question, I guess, uh, for the panel as a whole. Um, learning uh, from the trends in pharma when, throughout the 70s um, and, and, and then the advent of biotech through the 80s, uh, there was a, a Really, all you needed was safety and efficacy. Moving into the 90s, you needed safety, efficacy, and differentiation of your products. And then we've seen trends over the last many years now um, where another level is, is required, safety, efficacy, differentiation, and now reimbursement. And we see a lot of this in immunotherapies and so forth. Now, drawing on those, uh, drawing on lessons from pharma, I'm curious where you may see the role of reimbursement in helping drive innovation or help setting uh, goals as to where uh, where uh, the convergence of these fields should be going, and I leave it up to you. Anybody like to comment? Bob, exactly. Just briefly. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if, you, if this is what you're getting at, but in terms of pharma, um, you know, we got to keep in mind too. There's usually for for pharmaceutical agents, there's usually more phase three type data 
um, or comparative data that might have compared the, the current agent to a prior agent, and then obviously cost enters into a factor, and then obviously that enters into a decision in terms of reimbursement. I think probably what we need to do, certainly in medical devices, is pay a, a more attention to the data that's accumulated at, at the point of kind of the, the, the preclinical development phase, the clinical phase, because usually there is less of that robust comparative data comes out later, and then obviously costs are compared. And there are ways to do that, meaning pay more attention to the data that's out there, Bayesian uh, statistical, uh, you know, type models and so forth. So I think that we're going to have to be more rigorous in terms of that kind of clinical research concept to look at those data and think in terms of at some point it's going to be compared to another standard device and say which costs more, and then think in terms of reimbursement. So. I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Anybody else in the panel? Sure, I'd like to comment. I think the role of reimbursement will be um, very important as we go forward. Look at look at some past decisions uh, when uh, PET scanning, positron emission tomography, uh, it wasn't paid for by Medicare. It was only a research tool. Then Medicare decided we'll pay for it clinically. So hospitals adopted that technology. Look at um, a great career field used to be physical therapy. Uh, we can never get enough. Um, they could make a whole lot of money, and then CMS said, it's too many home care physical therapy visits. We'll cut them by a third. The jobs went away. The care went away. As we go forward, I've said, there won't be more money in the system. There'll be a whole lot yet less as they pay for value. So what gets paid for, how those decisions are made, the device companies and the biopharma companies that will go to CMS and and uh, develop reimbursement for their product in advance. When you go to 5,000 hospitals, <coughs> we've already gotten it paid for the, with the stents. Lots of device companies did those sorts of things. Um, I don't think it'll be easy, but I think that'll be a real important uh, impact. We certainly recognize that there's a, a close relationship that has to happen um, from FDA working with its CMS, you know, sister agency in Health and Human Services. Um, this year, our Entrepreneurs in Residence program, one of the projects is how can they make that 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 relate that pathway more smoothly. We're going to be deconstructing the problem of getting reimbursement along with um, FDA approval. Our three companies that are currently moving down the innovation pathway, they've all asked for uh, sort of an audience with CMS, and so we're taking them there so we can understand how how they interact. Because the the key here is to make sure that the evidence that they're collecting is going to support decisions made both for approval and also for reimbursement. Any other panelists? Yeah, actually, I, uh, there's a, a real-world example, Cyberonics, a Vegas nerve stimulation company. They implant a box, and it works for refractory epilepsy. And they went out there trying to get uh, refractory depression, devastating, devastating indication. CMS said no. Now, they're going to have four publications by the time this year is over, basically saying, guess what? If you looked at these refractory patients, how much money are you spending taking care of them? All of a sudden, now you're going to have a re-challenge saying, look, Here's the cost effectiveness. So you've got a situation. Everybody knows phase one, phase two, phase three. But there's also phase four, which the FDA requires you to go out there and say, what happens afterwards? And what happens afterwards here can be very different. And when they have that body of data, that's something where the medical device industry can look at the pharmaceutical industry and say, yes, we now do have a body of data, and we do want to go out there and do it better, faster, cheaper. Okay, so we're, I'm, I'm sorry, I know there are a lot of questions, and we, <clears throat> we could go on for a long time, but we are going to have to wrap it up. I just wanted to comment on, on the last question. There was a game plan a, a, um, um, a, a, that was learned along the way by the various stakeholders on controlling costs that led to some disincentives, as, as Steve pointed out, uh, along the way during pharma, and that all played, all the things you mentioned played out over several years from building in safety, um, more clinical um, efficacy and effectiveness data to health economics and reimbursement strategies. Pharma was not there in the early 90s. By the end of the 90s, they were well on their way to getting there. That doesn't have to happen with medical devices now because they, they have the game plan. They know what they did then. I'm talking about some of the major payers. They can just do it. Now, the problem with that is that devices aren't the same as drugs. I already mentioned that. But it's a, it's a real issue, but who owns it? I think that that's something, and I'm, I'm glad we um, talked about some of these things, that we as entrepreneurs, as inventors, creators, developers, investors, have to take this all into account as we go forward. And also work, um, 
with payers and others to understand where they're coming from. I was just at a meeting on innovation in Washington two weeks ago. Payers were there. They're, I think Steve's point about getting the incentives right is vital. There right now is no incentive for payers to change their attitudes. They are the most profitable part of healthcare today. And unless we get them incented, we can't do that. Okay, we're done. <laughs>